Hi, everybody. Dr. Glenn Bowman is a professor of history at Elizabeth City State University. He was formerly director of international is was formerly director of international programs at ECSU. He earned his PhD in history at the University of Minnesota. Originally from suburban Philadelphia, he has been at ECSU since 1999. At ECSU, Dr. Bowman teaches a variety of upper level and lower level courses in history and has published widely in academic journals. He served as the chair of Department of History and Political Science from 2008 to 2011. In 2005, he established the Leonard Ballou Memorial Fund, which was suppo uh, supported student travel scholarships and funded activities addressing the recruitment and retention of students. The funds have come from the royalties from The Razor's Edge, a critical thinking text world history reader that he authored. It was in print for almost 10 years. In <coughs> In 2015, he authored Elizabeth City State University, 1891 to 2016, a continuity of historical legacy and excellence and resilience. Dr. Bowman speaks regularly at community gatherings about the history of the African-American education and the history of Elizabeth City. Welcome back to Dr. Dr. Bowman. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is great being back. I said this is exciting for me. I was here back in November 2018, and this crowd was inspiring then, and I'm looking out here today, and I just feel the energy. I, I feel the support. I feel the love, and thank you for bringing me back here. And again, thank you, Mr. Cofield, for inviting me. Thank you, Ms. Legner, for your, your helping getting this ready for tonight. Um, today is going to be a little different, even though it's 2020. I want to talk about a topic that happened about 100 years ago. And the topic of the day is called Celebrating a Tercentennial. Okay, what's a tercentennial? Celebrating a Tercentennial, Northeastern North Carolina and the piv pivotal year of 1919. Uh, before I start here, I want to say uh, that the research that went into this presentation uh, was funded in part by the North Carolina Humanities Council. And I'd like to thank them for that. Uh, said, I've given this talk a number of times in the region, and I'm giving this talk next week at the Pasquotank County Library, uh, and I've gotten some good response from it, but I would like to say thank you to the North Carolina Humanities Council, um, and they fund other programs in the state uh, that help bring humanities education, including history, to the people of the Tar Heel State, so thank you uh, for that. Um, today we're going to talk about something called a tercentennial. You say, what's that? You might say, I know a lot of vocabularies, but that one wasn't in there. What's a tercentennial? And if this were a little smaller, I would ask for hands, and if it were one of my classes, because I just came back from open house today at ECSU, so I'm wearing my Viking blue here and <laughs> talking to students, so um, but I would ask them, and they'd be asked, they'd be, especially would figure it out what it was. And what's a tercentennial? Basically, a tercentennial is a 300th anniversary. 300th anniversary. Uh, we might remember the bicentennial back from 1976. I actually, I do remember that bicentennial. I remember the music and Paul McCartney and the Wings and Elton John and such. I remember those days, uh, but that seems a long distance back. But tercentennial, we haven't even reached that yet as a, as a country. Uh, and one day we will, one day we will. But how this developed, and this is the thing about history, a lot of times, you're not looking for something, and it just shows up anyway. It's kind of serendipity. And I'm working on a project right now. Uh, this is kind of a follow-up to the book I wrote in 2015. But the project I'm working on right now is kind of a history of secondary education, post-primary education, but not university education. For African Americans in Northeastern North Carolina, from the end of the Civil War until 1969. Okay, so those were some ups and downs and some, 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 some trials and tribulations. A and in doing this research, I spent a lot of time reading newspapers. And I, and I mean, not the current newspaper. Sometimes it's hard enough to get through one of those uh, as it is. But I mean, looking back, and I actually have read pretty much every single issue of every newspaper that was produced in Elizabeth City from about 1900 until about 1970, okay? 
And when you, when you read so much history, you see things and you read things that you have never heard about. And they were major stories. And this is something that came out in many ways, yes, old newspapers are kind of a, a time capsule of a lost world, a world that we would not recognize at all. And so that's kind of how this topic developed. I wasn't looking for it. It appeared, and so I'm bringing it to you today. Uh, 1919 was kind of a major year in this region's history. I, mean, I remember 1919, that was 101 years ago. But it was a major year in, in some regards. And in some ways, it also reminds us how far we've come and how that world of the past is, is not here anymore uh, in some ways. In some ways, it's a positive thing. Um, 1919, there was a new law on the books statewide, the compulsory attendance law. Students were actually now required to go to school. Like, really? A radical notion? Children being in school so they could learn? Well, that was a radical idea. And back in 1919, a lot of people didn't like that because farmers wanted the kids to stay home to work on the farm. A and for that note, I've seen newspapers into the 1940s in which uh, African-American schools were kept closed during the, the cotton picking season, okay? So again, that, that continued long after 1919. Also in 1919, something else that appeared, uh, the first visit in the South by Margaret Sanger. Uh, her first place she visited in the South was actually Elizabeth City. And she actually spoke not only at the uh, Alcarama Theater, but also spoke at Cornerstone Baptist Church and also spoke on the campus of Elizabeth City State Color Normal School, the first name of which is now called the Elizabeth City State University. And in fact, that's your ECSU too. This is an area that serves, we're proud to serve Dare County, um, but 1919. That's a long time ago. So there's a lot going on in the world and a lot going on in this region back in 1919. Uh, 1919 was 300 years after the first Africans who were brought to the part of America that was the original 16 colony, I'm sorry, the original 13 colonies. Uh, there were Africans brought to southwestern America before that point, uh, even into Florida. But the ones that we think of as the 13 colonies, 1619 was a the first year, and in 2019, and you might have read about this in the New York Times, you might have read about it in the Time Magazine, but 2019 was the 400th anniversary, kind of a quadricentennial. Uh, in fact, um, just look on the website here. In other words, 1919 was 300 years. 2019 was 400 years. Uh, you can see here, uh, this was, an, this, was uh, this was a difficult year because exactly are you celebrating 400 years? Are you commemorating 400 years? Are you, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's, it's tough because those 400 years have not been very easy uh, for African Americans. And, but the fact is, is that 2019, that, that date was more in the news. It was more in the news. Now, was it back in 1919 in the news? Not really. In 1919, that event was pretty much com almost completely out of people's knowledge. It was an event that most people hadn't even been forced to confront. In 1919, for most Americans, just went from beginning to end, and there was no discussion, no mention whatsoever that this was 300 years. In many ways, the 300th anniversary of African American history, the African American experience and what became the 13 colonies. Um, now, there were some exceptions, and this is what I'm going to talk about today. The exception was in the northeastern part of North Carolina. In other words, the forgotten northeastern corner of the state, uh, which is still the case back in 1919. It's still the case in 2020, uh, as we know. Uh, but the exception was that. The point I want to make today here is in 1919, even though most of the rest of this country did not know what had happened 300 years earlier, it was different in this part of the country. The exception was in northeastern North Carolina. Now, I think, how did this start? Who, who was involved? Who organized this? Well, anybody who's been in Elizabeth City and been around the public library knows that there are some historical markers around the town. And many of you probably, and if you've been visiting, you might have noticed the historical marker that notes this gentleman. Uh, William Oscar Saunders was an unusual man. Uh, 
even if he were around today, he would still be seen as kind of unusual in, in some ways. In 1919, he was simply just um, almost in the wrong place in the wrong time, but, but, but in a good way, but, but in a good way. Uh, Saunders had a newspaper he edited called The Independent. He met Independent. He was somebody who railed against party politics, uh, the, the party machines that controlled many towns like Elizabeth City. He was one of the first white North Carolinians who actually vocally expressed the need for education for African Americans. He, he was decades ahead of his time. Uh, he also was sometimes not always liked, in part for saying things that he thought needed to be said. Uh, for example, one time, uh, somebody didn't like what Mr. Saunders had printed about his wife. In those days, you didn't flag some of the internet, you didn't send somebody a nasty email. And, and this time, somebody who didn't like Saunders went down to his office and, I'm gonna say for lack of a better word, beat him up. That's how it was done back in 1919. <laughs> Another time, I read that after a Sunday evening church service, some members were tired of hearing from Mr. Saunders and went down with their guns and blew holes in his house. After, after Sunday, so th this, this man was somebody who was just willing to do what others would not do. Uh, well, by 1919, by this point, he had become not only just the founder and editor of a major newspaper, but also the chair of the board of managers of what was called the Elizabeth City State Color Normal School. In other words, today, he would be the chair of the Board of Trustees of Elizabeth City State University. So that was a pretty prominent position. Not only that, though, he was actually serving in the General Assembly representing Pasquotain County. So he not only was locally connected, but connected to Raleigh. So he was in a unique position to do something. So in other words, and this was very unusual because he was not only connected to the normal school and to its African-American uh, principal and professors and such, but he was also connected to the power, the most powerful office in the state of North Carolina, the office of the governor. And he had heard from his contacts that there was going to be uh, an anniversary. Now, again, like it's hard to explain maybe in these days, I mean, he was a national figure. He was a national figure. He had articles published all throughout the country uh, from the New York age. Uh, we wish again to express our admiration for Mr. Saunders. He lives in a southern state and openly publishes his brave, strong words against the sins of the people amongst whom he lives. If anyone doubts that this takes real courage, I, and the fact is that it did. Well, he decided that he was going to work with the area black community to note and to commemorate, to recognize the 300th anniversary of the first Africans in what became the 13 colonies. In February 1919, about 101 years ago, because this is the middle of February, uh, Saunders invited the governor of North Carolina to speak at the region's African Americans for the 300th anniversary. Uh, and again, this was itself a pretty big step. This was gonna be a key part of the celebration or commemoration, depends how you look at it. According to the Independent, this will be the biggest and most interesting celebration ever attempted by, and this is the words that were used at the time, 1919, remember, the Negroes of the city in the vicinity. Uh, so this was not gonna be just one event, not just one person speaking, this was gonna be a week-long series of events. Now we might say, why did they choose April 1919? Well, Mr. Saunders, according to his knowledge of history, he believed that actually it was in April 1619 that the first Africans arrived on the Dutch ship landing near Jamestown, Virginia. Actually, last year, the, it was August that was the month, because now we figured out that it was probably around late summer that this happened. But Saunders just thought April, that's what he heard, so that's why it was April. So there was an effort made to make this exactly the 300th anniversary. This won't be just one day, this will be an entire week's worth of events. And it wasn't just gonna involve one town, it was gonna involve all of Northeastern North Carolina. It would be a regional event of sorts. And this took a lot of planning. It involved the Chamber of Commerce as well. It involved the mayor's office. It involved, of course, the General Assembly and the governor's office. I mean, how do you, plus outside speakers who would come in. Uh, and this was a major planning achievement. Uh, 
Uh, they even got reduced rates for railway transportation. Get as many people here as possible. Uh, and according to the Daily Advance, which was a competitor to the independent at this point, uh, the Chamber of Commerce said that white citizens were going to work with African Americans to make this event remembered as a milestone, a milestone in the history of the Negro race. In other words, this was going to be something that was very unusual, working together to recognize a historical event that pertained to African American history. To us, it's not that uncommon. We have Black History Month. Back in 1919, there was called Negro History Week, and it was a brand new event, started by Carter Woodson. So this was something that was, at the time, uh, radical in many regards. And when I say major planning, uh, the plan was that they estimated about 5,000 African Americans from outside of Pascotain County coming in to hear the governor to be part of the celebration or commemoration, depends how you look at it. Uh, Gates County, Camden County, Curta County, uh, approximately 25,000 invitations went out. 25,000, th I mean that, that's a major, that's a major press, that's a major promotional campaign. Even today, 25, and this is locally, I mean nationally, that's not that big, but locally, 25,000, 101 years ago. This was going to be something that was going to be special. And they were going to bring in some outside speakers who were very prominent in the African American community. Uh, one of those locally in Norfolk was a man named Dr. Charles S. Morris. Uh, the Boynton Institute no longer exists, but he was regarded as a, a Bible scholar, a, a speaker who supported Booker T. Washington's ideals of independence and, and self-worth and, and um, effort and respect and such. Uh, also invited to speak was a professor from Howard University called Kelly Miller. Uh, Kelly Miller was one of the editors who worked closely with W.E.B. Du Bois uh, for the Crisis magazine. And Miller was unique in that he was the first African American to be admitted to John Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. Now again, this is 100 years ago. That was a special event. That was, in other words, Miller was a major national figure, an intellectual, uh, a sociologist, as well had trained in other areas as well. He was coming to town to speak. So this was gonna be something every day going on, not just, not just, one, not just one day. Um, but the emphasis, the planning, the big highlight of the week was gonna be the visit of the governor Governor Thomas Walter Bickett. Thomas Walter Bickett was from a small town near Raleigh named Lewisburg. Uh, Lewisburg is like, it's still a pretty small town. You know, it's, I don't know, about maybe 4,000, 5,000. If you look at a map of uh, Lewisburg, you will see that the main road is actually called Bickett Boulevard. Uh, so clearly, Lewisburg is still Bickett City, even though he passed away nearly 100 years ago. Um, in other words, what happened is Saunders, who was the representative from Pasco Tank, talked to the governor, and the governor agreed to come to town during this week. So that was, that was going to be the big highlight of the week. Uh, it was going to be held at the historic Mount Lebanon AME Zion Church. This is to this day still a historic church. The church was established in 1850. And this was established as actually by whites who were part of the Methodist church in the area. In 1850, African Americans were not allowed to be educated. I said, they, I said there were some who, there were many free blacks who lived in the area and they may have been educated, but in general, it was against the law to have an, a person of African descent actually speak, to be a minister, to be trained as a minister. The thinking was that education would give people too much freedom and, and too much ability to think for themselves and would make them question things. So education was kind of strongly, it was against the law. It was against the law to educate a slave to read and write. Um, so the AME Zion Church was established in 1850 and ultimately, and still to this day, exists on Culpeper Street in Elizabeth City. Uh, it's, a, it's a major historic part of Elizabeth City. This was going to be the site of the governor's speech. 
Now, anybody who has visited this church, and I've been in this church a number of times, 5,000 people won't hold, that's, that's not enough. A and we know for a fact that there were so many people there that they didn't have anything close to the amount of room, so people were outside, okay? So this was, again, standing room only, standing room only, and some outside. Now, here's how it worked. The governor made it Monday, April 7, 1919. This is interesting to me. The pastor of the church was a man named Pastor White, Reverend White. Now, today, if a speaker came to a church, the pastor would probably be introducing the speaker, right? Okay. That wasn't done back then. The way it was done was, according to the social niceties of the time, it was sitting as improper to have a person of color, African American, introduce somebody as prominent as a governor that was seen as socially too close to equality. In other words, even though it was this man's church and his congregation, he wasn't allowed to introduce the governor in his own church. The way it worked was the pastor introduced the U.S. District Attorney, a man named Edwin Fairby Aidlet, and then Aidlet introduced the governor. So kind of introduced the introducer, and then that person introduces, like, 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 you know, like a chain. To us, that seems kind of like cut out the middleman. Okay, you only need one person to introduce. Okay, I didn't need two introductions tonight. One was more than enough, and thank you, thank you for that. Um, but th this just seems to us just kind of, and the funny about Aidlet, Aidlet was, and I'm gonna get into him a little bit later on, he was a piece of work. Uh, I'll leave it at that for now. He was a piece of work. I mean, in many ways, him be actually even being in the church was actually in many ways offensive to those in the congregation, but that just, that was the way it, during Jim Crow how it was. Um, we know that out of about 1,500 in attendance, and that's a pretty big number. If you've been in that church, you might wonder, how did they get so many people in that building? Uh, 1,200 were African Americans and 300 were whites. As part of the way things were done at that time, they had a separate roped off area. Okay, whites were in that area, or one area, and they had their own bathrooms and their own, I mean, it was just all done. And now that was, to us, to us that seemed kind of a waste of time, a waste of time. If not insulting, but that was just the way things were done at that time, unfortunately. So we have a full house, and we're here to see the governor. And the governor is here because he's speaking to, to, to honor, to commemorate the 300th anniversary. And most of those 300 years were pretty horrendous years for those who came after, those first came on the ship in 1619. You're talking about centuries of slavery and oppression uh, and beyond that the governor has a chance to at least mark this moment um, Thomas Pickett was like many southern governors at the time kind of a man of contradictions uh, we know for a fact that he actually did some things that might be seen as surprising he was known at that time for being a governor who pardoned a lot of people and that's the power of the governor Power the president, pardon people for whatever reason you want. Uh, and Bickett was kind of known as that. A and he was somebody who, despite his firm belief in Jim Crow, despite his own negative stereotypes, as we're going to see tonight, he actually did a lot to free African Americans whom he thought were wrongly convicted from jails. And not only that, though, we also know that Bickett, during a mob scene, prevented a man from being lynched to death. Now, again, that takes courage when you're standing between a mob and a jail cell and saying, you need to leave, go, leave, calm down, just get out of here. And he successfully, so he saved a man's life. He saved an African-American's life. But then again, a man of contradictions. How could one say and believe so many things that we would see today as apparently racist and also save a man's life? It, it's just, that was just the South back in 1919. And when you read it, you wonder, how did people think this way? But that's just the way it was. Well, what exactly did the governor say that day? Do we know what he said? Well, the good news is that we don't have just a guess. We have a pretty good idea what he said. Because the Daily Advance and other papers actually took a lot of time going over the governor's speech. They actually had somebody there apparently even recording it and having, so we have almost like a pretty clearful transcript not 100%, but a pretty good transcript of what was said in that day. 
Uh, and people actually were complaining about how much time the governor got in the paper. He said, the paper said, we apologize, but the editor of the advance is always ready to yield to Governor Bickett, and the local items could afford for once to wait. So in other words, this is an important visit, and we're just going to let the local stuff wait until tomorrow. So, so this, again, so when I say this was a huge event, it was a huge event. Now, what did he say, really? Well, from what I can tell you right off the bat here, the speech was kind of like a mixed bag. You know the expression, a mixed bag? In many ways, this speech, in my opinion at least, was a mixed bag, a, a bag of popcorn mixed with a bag of nails. <laughs> you think that's a kind of unusual, that's, a kind of a, that's definitely a mixed bag. Okay. In other words, there was a little, a little bit of popcorn, a little bit of light nutrition, a little bit, but a lot of things that were like sharp as nails, and nails hurt, and there was definitely some of that in the speech. And this is just kind of the contradiction at the time. A man who offered wisdom, but the speech was wisdom offered in condescension. I, I mean, a dignitary, but a man who's a dignitary who tells inappropriate jokes. I mean, it's, it's just kind of strange. So I'm not going to go over the whole speech, okay, because you're already hearing my speech. You don't need to hear the governor's speech. Uh, but I wanted to say, how am I going to do this? I decided to go rely upon an old movie to kind of organize this. You know, and I'm not really, I'll be honest here, I've seen a few Clint Eastwood movies. Like, like who hasn't? But I've never seen this movie, but I know the name. Okay, because I'm not a big Western guy. I, I'm not a big gun guy. I, I just, I'm just not. Dirty Harry, I, I can relate to a little bit, a little bit more than this. So, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to show you some of the good, share some of the bad, and then some of the, oh my, ugly. Because I just want you to just an idea of, of the, I'm not going to go over the whole ugly, but there's some things that need to be said here. Well, first the good, okay? First the good. Let's we'll start off on a positive note here tonight, sure. Okay, the speech he actually praised the returning troops, especially the African-American troops who had just come back from the Great War, the war that we call World War I. World War I ended in 1918. The troops were coming back early 1919, and he wanted to make a positive word to say great job troops for serving your country. That was, that was good. I mean, that's, always support the troops, that's great. Absolutely, that's good. He said it was important to respect women. Which, again, I would have to agree with that. You know, I give flowers on Mother's Day. I speak to my 96-year-old my grandmother. Um, I believe in respecting women, of course. And you would hear a lot more of that back in 1919, respect women. Um, and, and that's true. And I can't, who, can't, who can't agree with that? Okay, that seems pretty straightforward. Not only that, though, we actually condemned the white people who took advantage of African Americans. This is a direct quote. He said that we white people owe it to our white blood to treat a Negro or white. Now, again, that's the words he used in 1919. Again, white blood. We wouldn't, we wouldn't use that word today. And that's good, because I don't know about you, but the troops who fought overseas, whether they were white or black, bled the same kind of blood. Their blood was red, just like everybody else's. Uh, but which, which is right. I mean, but the point here is that we need to not exploit African Americans. Now the funny thing was, Adlet was the one who introduced the governor. There's anybody in Elizabeth City back in 1919 who did more exploiting than this man, E.F. Adlet. I don't know. Adlet, when he died in 1930, the newspaper did a, a story about how many assets he left behind. Uh, he left a net worth, and this, and this was 1930, of about $400,000. That was probably more like $10 million today. How did he get a lot of that money? Well, we know that Adlet was a good lawyer. Adlet kind of got his big rise to fame when he was involved in the famous Nell Cropsey case back in the early 1900s in Elizabeth City. But he also got most of that money, we think, from actually owning tar paper shacks, subpar housing, oh, right, he was a slumlord who took advantage of poor African Americans, who did not have the chance to buy homes on credit, who could not get a mortgage, and who made, basically exploited people. So he got most of his money by that way. So it's funny that the governor actually says, we need to do better, and the man who introduced him is sitting right next to him, and he's the one who's guilty more than anybody else in the entire room of doing what he told him not to do. I mean, it just to us seems like the, is the, the ultimate, like, it, it just seems to us, that's the way things were, though. 
fortunately now we have fairer laws in housing. So anybody who has good credit and who meets the standards can go get a house in general. There's some exceptions where there's still some race-based discrimination in housing. That's just the way things are. But it's a lot better now than it was back in 1919. We know that. Um, the governor, and this I thought was kind of strange, the governor also said that he was glad that Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. A southern governor said Lincoln was right. It's like, well, gee, we should have said that back in 1861. If we had this, we wouldn't have had to fight a war in the first place. I guess better late, better than never. Okay, And it's a direct quote, God allowed slavery to be instituted in his own good time and for his own good purposes, and it is on good time. God blotted it out. So it's like, uh, God ended slavery. I always thought that it was the Emancipation Proclamation and ultimately the victory of the North during the Civil War that actually ultimately, but you know, I, it's just strange to see a governor actually mentioning this. Um, he did also give some good financial advice. And, and one, of his, one of his quotations was to his audience, get a job and freeze to it like a mud turtle. No, I, I never knew mud turtles could freeze. I mean, I like turtles, and I think they're wonderful. They're one of my favorite animals out there. I'm one of those drivers, if I see a turtle, I'm going to make sure and I avoid, and if it's quiet on the road, I'll stop and move the turtle, whether the turtle likes it or not. Um, but I never knew you could actually freeze to a job like a mud turtle, and I must have gotten a good laugh. And I, I kinda, that's good advice, isn't it? You know, when the Silhouettes came out with their song, Get a Job, you know, that's, it's a good <laughs> message. It's a good song. It still rings true today. I'm not going to sing in here, but you know what the song lyrics are? Get a job. The governor is right. So far, so good, right? He also gave some other financial advice. Uh, he encourages listeners to save some money every week. Nothing wrong with that. If some slick salesperson comes to your door, sick the dog on him. <laughs> Who's going to argue with that advice? I, I don't know to a certain extent. I don't know. I don't have a dog, but I don't like people calling me when I don't want to be bothered with and having me try to buy stuff I don't need. You know, no one likes that. If that doesn't work, then let your wife beat him with the hot skillet. Now, this, is the fun, this, this, this is the punchline. And if you get in trouble for it, I will pardon you. Now, I, I mean, that, that, that got a roar probably in the audience because everybody knew the governor had a reputation for pardoning people. And he's saying, you know what, do this, and if you do, I'll pardon you. What the heck? I'll pardon everybody else. Why not? I'll pardon you too. I mean, that's good advice though. I guess except for the dog part, I don't think it's right to put dogs on people like that, but anyway, it's pretty, pretty good. So far, so far, so good. Okay, now the bad. And I am just saying this is what it, what it, what it was. Uh, these are some things that we would consider to be stereotypical, stereotypes. Uh, and one of the things I noticed here was he said, this is a direct quotation, as a race you have two faults. You don't make enough, you don't make enough. Well, um, and of course I'm thinking here is like, well, if people actually had a chance to get jobs fairly based upon their own merits, maybe they could earn more. But that's whatever. And you spend too much of what you do make. The Negro is the best spender on earth. Now, now, now note, note the irony here. Who's saying this? Okay, I mean, I don't know about you, but I always thought that the best spenders on earth were found here. I, I don't know about you. <laughs> I mean, and here's a governor and Raleigh's spending money, and he's telling, I mean, he's just like, the governor, you, I mean, the money you spend, it's like, how could you, it, it just strikes me as like completely, completely ironic in, a, in not a positive way. Um, he also told some off-color jokes, using the N-word. Now, granted, this was at a historic black church on an anniversary that's supposed to be theirs, okay? And thank goodness, and I know the governor made a trip to Elizabeth City about a year ago, and he spoke back at Mount Lebanon. A and I guarantee he didn't say anything like that, and no governor would. And thank goodness we live in an age when that's no longer acceptable in North Carolina. Uh, but in, in the media mentions the jokes, but fortunately they didn't publish that. But just imagine being the pastor of the church, and you're up there and you're hearing this. And it's your church, and, and it just to me would be disrespectful, uh, overwhelmingly disrespectful. But that's what he said, what can you do? Um, now the ugly, I mean, uglier than, uglier than jokes? 
the governor said that 300 years ago, there were 10 million Indians and only a handful of Africans. That's 1619. In 1619, the Americas were filled with millions of natives who had come over the land bridge that used to link Alaska to what's now Russia. They came through Canada, into North America, into the, the United States, all the way through the Americas. So there were millions of natives here when, in 1619, those first Africans arrived on that Dutch ship near Jamestown, Virginia. And now today, 300 years later, in 1919, there are only a handful of natives, and yet 12 million of you. And again, th th is, this, is he right? He is right here. It's true that completely th the numbers of natives were, were, were pretty much almost gone. And meanwhile, those, that handful of natives, I'm sorry, Africans who came on that ship had now come to now 12 million. And why did this happen? In the hard school of slavery, you learn the lesson of obedience. The Indian would not, and as a race, he has perished from the earth. And this is a speech, remember this. Governor said that freedom, and this is a direct quotation, freedom, unwisely used, may be a curse instead of a blessing. The cage protects the tiger as well as the man outside. The governor added, you've heard it said that eternal vigilance is the price of liberty, but obedience, eternal obedience is the price of life. Let the tiger in your breast escape and you will be shot or lynched. Said that to a prominently African-American audience and a prominent African-American church on an anniversary that was theirs. And again, the, the, sad, the, the, the ugly part is that it, in many ways he was true. It was right. And that was, he was actually in many ways putting into words the, the fear that Americans of color had to face during this time. I mean, it was true that lynchings continued. And even though North Carolina was better than many states, North Carolina was better than Mississippi, better than Alabama, better than Georgia, better than South Carolina, better than Arkansas, better than Texas, but it was still a major risk. And again, but it was just, I mean, I don't know what the audience reacted and how they reacted, but I'm certain they understood what he was saying. I, I, I mean, I, I'm not saying that he was trying to defend the practice. I don't think it's fair to say the governor was defending lynching. I mean, he did save a man's life. And, I, and I'll tell you this, you know, I try to do my part to help out humanity, but I've never saved a man's life. And most, maybe some of you have. And if you have, you, kn you know feeling that I don't understand. And I can, but I can appreciate that. Um, the governor had done that. But, but these are ugly words, nonetheless, because if only the governor put the everyday fears of people into such frank, no-nonsense, so, no in cold terms, on, a, on an anniversary of sorts. It was almost like, a here is your reality. 300 years later, things haven't really, in many ways, changed. Okay. Now, of course, that was from the main parts of the speech. Now, of course, remember, this was done by prominent whites, prominent African Americans. But what did the people think about this? What did the people think about the parade and the speakers and the governor's visit? Did they really get excited about it? Well, from what we know, this was, this was done the, um, the last day of the event, April 11, 1919. There was a parade, and this was supposed to be the biggest parade ever in Elizabeth City. Well, Newspaper said, we, and this was Saunders here writing, by the way, the man who organized this in the first place. Regarding the parade, the absence of the crowds justified by a tercentennial celebration indicated that, in his view, the colored folk weren't, all the, weren't not all enthusiastic over the idea of celebrating their inauspicious beginning in America. And you think, well, you know, a parade. Parades are nice. Governor's visit. Man at least shows up. So the man shows up. He knows that we're here. Comes to a church. 
Uh, but what, a bit more, what would be more appropriate than a parade? What do you think those African Americans in 1919 would have wanted more than a parade? Well, let's get a list here. Maybe they would have wanted perhaps equal schools. How about the right to vote? And again, there were people of color who were able to vote. I've seen the voter rolls. There were a handful, a very small handful, but not many. Right to serve on a jury of their peers? That would be nice, too. That didn't really happen, either. Protection from lynch mobs. Yeah, that, that would be nice, better than a parade. Sure. How about equal opportunity for jobs? Equal opportunity for housing? And I could add other things. How about access to parks and recreational areas? Sure. All better than a parade. What else was going on in 1919? Not just this major week-long commemoration, celebration, recognition, but call it. You know, what else happened in 1919? What was really going on in the lives of African Americans in 1919? Well, this was the so-called red summer of 1919. Later on that year was arguably one of the worst, if not the worst year since about 1901 for violence bad. 30 cities. And many of those who were killed were returning troops from overseas. But many of those who were killed were returning troops who had just put their lives on the line for their country and had come back home to be killed. Okay, so in other words, 1919, I mean, despite the celebration, it's a long way to go. A long way to go. But I don't want to end on a negative note. I, I want to end on at least something, one more, one more point here. Is in some ways, if you look back, and what did this event mean in the history of North Carolina? What did it mean in terms of the history of this country? In many ways, this event in 1919 that linked together many of the counties in northeastern North Carolina, in some ways was a precursor to an organization that developed called the Commission on Interracial Cooperation. Uh, this was a commission. Uh, this was created actually in 1919. And it was actually created with, in part, Julius Rosenwald Fund Money. Now, I'm certain many of you have heard about the Rosenwald schools that are being restored. You may have heard about the Rosenwald schools on the campus of ECSU that are being, uh, that have received some grants and are being renovated in time. Well, Rosenwald gave money to other causes that were linking African Americans to the rest of the state. And one of these was this organization. Uh, this consisted of many of those individuals who actually helped organize this 1919 event in Elizabeth City. Uh, prominent professionals in both white and black communities. And yes, it in included President Bias. He was a member of this committee. He was a member of the North Carolina version of this, the North Carolina Commission. Uh, John Henry Bias was somebody who was beloved by whites and blacks alike in Elizabeth City. He was an uncle who everybody liked. He was a likable guy. He was just, a, um, and so he was part of this organization that came out around the same time. Now, the North Carolina branch wasn't organized until 1921, but prominent members of this organization included uh, Nathan Newbold, who was actually born uh, in Elizabeth City, and he became, for many decades, he was the state's leading official on black education. He was the director of Negro education in the state superintendent's office in Raleigh. He was born and raised in Elizabeth City. He was a key member of this. John Henry Bias was a key member of this. So was Harold Leonard Trigg, who was the uh, man who succeeded John Henry Bias as president of uh, what became, after uh, John Bias's death, State Teachers College. Okay. Uh, this also included uh, Durham businessman C.C. Spalding, whose life insurance company was the largest business owned and operated by African Americans in the United States of America. He was a member of this. But the bottom line was, even at this time, it, th this, it was a, about interracial cooperation, but it was still dictated mostly by whites. Whites dominated that. Uh, it was interracial, but it wasn't anything close to 50-50. To and the thing about it, it was organized because of good intentions. And it was 
a group that did good things. It was a voice against lynching. It was a voice against Ku Klux Klan violence. These were whites largely saying, this is wrong. This needs to stop. This is immoral. This is not rule of law. This is mob violence. This is not us. And that was important. Uh, this group also encouraged FDR to expand the New Deal to help out African Americans. And if you come to the campus of ECSU, you might go and see Moore Hall. And note that in the back of Moore Hall, there are two separate wings that are now attached to the building. Those wings were built in the late 1930s from New Deal money. In the late 1930s, during John Henry Bice's administration, there was something called the National Youth Administration, the NYA. That had an office on the campus, and that office was there to help out poor young men of color to get jobs working in trades, carpentry, farming, bricklaying, and such. Also came from New Deal money. So in many ways, this commission did some good. And in many ways, what happened in April 1919 was kind of a precursor of that. But like the event in 1919, uh, the event only really underscored just how far progress had to go uh, before it could truly be achieved and, and recognized as progress. Thank you.